Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that has caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me is Senior Editor Matt. Hello. And welcome to new key contributor, Byron. Yay! Hello, everybody. <laughs> welcome, Byron. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so excited. I've been okay. wanting to get on this podcast for days. So, very, yeah. very good. Very good. Yeah. Okay, this week. We're looking at the latest news around Ford's Baby Ranger Ute with a little eye on what's happening with the new Ranger we're expecting in 2022. We'll give you our thoughts on some new entrants to the Cars Guide garage this week and some not so new entrants when it comes to uh, Byron's pick for the week. And we'll catch up with the auto industry's Twitter in chief in this week's Must Watch. So stay with us. But first of all, we've had some feedback and um, Last week, we were talking about the potential for a Nissan Navara Nismo V8, um, mm-hmm. a speculative story from our own Andrew Chesterton. That's what and he specialises in. He does. He, does. <laughs> He's, he ruminates, he speculates, um, he investigates. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've had some, some positive and some negative thoughts around the potential for that kind of vehicle. Um, Teresk is Loki, owns a Hilux dual cap. He mm-hmm. says it's mainly for commuting or off-road touring no heavy loads, but does carry bulky camping gear, and the ute works well for that. Um, He hates diesels, and there's nothing he would consider upgrading to, thinks a road-focused V8 ute would go well. Um, He has a soft Hmm. spot for the big two-wheel drive Tundra V8 utes, always wish they were available here. So he's probably right in the bullseye of the target market for for something like that. So he's responded and said, yeah, I'm up for it if it happens. Well, wouldn't he just buy a Ram? Or, or a cheap, or a cheap gladiola. I mean, gladiator. <laughs> and, I mean, both of those might be too big. Um, yeah, I mean, I the, the the ram may well be too big, but the mm. uh, the gladiator is a, an interesting thought. But um, yeah, get out yeah. there and grab a, a VS Series Three V8 Commodore <laughs> U. That'll be good. <laughs> well, yes, so our old mate, our old mate Birdie. Um, proud Victorian, uh, Byron, uh, has a VF2 SSV Redline Ute. He owns exactly that vehicle. Um, He says his ownership is not about looks because we're talking about the potential for these V8 Utes to be about image and and to take the place of HSVs and FPVs of of the past. He says not about looks, but effortless drivability, you know, which is lacking in every mainstream dual cab Ute, is his view. Um, and it's right. I mean, you get the car-like experience in a, in a Holden Ute or a, a Falcon Ute. Uh, he's not a Nissan lover, but the idea of a Navara with the V8 from the Patrol is very appealing, especially for Harrop Eaton superchargers fitted. Um, so he's taken, it, he's taken it one step further. With the price advantage Patrol has over Land Cruiser, Nissan might be able to produce the V8 Ute at an attractive price point. So he's seeing the Nissan machine as being able to produce mm. something like that at a relatively affordable price. There you go. Mate, I mean, in America, I... they have the the um, Frontier, is it? The Navara V8 Ute in America. Um, yeah. And it makes sense there, but it never sells well. Uh, because also, that's based, expensive. And that's based on the old D40. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Navara. Right, 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 right. But right, right, right. I, I think later on when we talk about future Fords coming, yeah. there is a an EcoBoost V6 petrol in that mix. That's for sure. So stay oh, okay. tuned, guys. Okay, that's good. That's good. In between us? Yep. <laughs> uh, our old mate Neza um, is all in for V8 utes. He says, who doesn't want a slammed Shelby Super Snake F-150? Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 not, I'm not particularly fussed, Neza, but anyway, he's, he's obviously very keen. Um, opportunity to fill the old V8 ute market with either high-output, low-capacity engines like AMG's M139, so that's the two liter in the current A45 CL45, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera, um, mm-hmm. or go full electric into a car like the rumoured Ford Focus-based Ute, which we're going to be talking about uh, very yeah. shortly. Um, that would surely scratch the performance itch. Check out Simone Goetz's Tesla Model 3 pickup on YouTube. The market is here. And that's, I think, the vehicle she calls Truckler, where yeah. she basically took the gas axe to the back of a Model 3 and created a tray in the back of it. And I refreshed my memory on that video after I saw um, uh, Neza's comment. And it is pretty good. She did a really fantastic job, actually, on that thing. And the amount of head-turning it gets on the uh, on the sidewalk is exceptional. 
Well, it's a completely different offering to a cyber truck, isn't it? So, yeah, it yeah, yeah, um, true, true. Much maybe there is a market for that. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there definitely is. Yeah. Omar Monel went just full on. He says if he ran the Nissan world, he would a create a division called Nissan Extreme, producing a V8 Nismo Ute for Australia and the US. B produce a six by six Titan diesel. <laughs> C build an off road SUV buggy powered by a VR thirty double T. So that's the three liter twin turbo V six. And D develop a small hardcore Jimny sized crossover. So he's got the product strategy all mapped out. It's Nissan Extreme, and I for one am totally on board. If if Omar can get that up, um, <laughs> I'll support it all the way. Can we add a twelve hundred U? With, um, it's a dado oh, yeah. a dado yeah, with yes. you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah i agree yeah. that'd be very nice I don't like, think on, so. on the other side of the coin we have three people that weren't so thrilled or were, were possibly a little more cynical um in fact roto ihu who comes from us from across the tasman he is uh one of our great kiwi mates says if nissan puts the five six five point six liter v8 into the current navara i'll come over to australia pay for 14 days in quarantine, and then one by one, lick each of your driveways clean. <laughs> Says, in re-engineering a platform to take an engine it was never designed for, Nissan would need to sell thousands annually, adding Nissan Australia can't build a case for a right-hand drive Titan conversion, which would cost a fraction of what it might to put a V8 in the Navara. So that's a pretty compelling uh, point of view, I've got to say. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Danik. I would be surprised if we see many high-riding high V8 utes. Nanny state emission regulations in major markets has pushed manufacturers to use forced induction and electrification to drive down engine capacity and cylinders. Speculation on the specs for the LC300, a case in point. Yep, so, 100%. Yeah. Hybrid, yeah. Is, hybrid is where it's going, less yeah. likely V8. So. Yeah. It's still got a lot of cachet, but reality yeah. is heading in another direction. It's exactly, safe. exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, now, to finish that off, the Triple W, a.k.a. W07, says, I'd say no. There is always hubbub, and I would like to award a gold star for the use of the word hubbub. There is always <laughs> hubbub uh, surrounding such things, but we never, all caps, see them. I give you the V8 or V6 Ranger as an example of much huff, but no puff. Yeah. So we could direct uh, the Triple W uh, Chesto's way for some of these speculative uh, pieces that he's put out there on our website. But that's a fair comment, I think. Yeah. And look, last week in our garage, uh, Tom, I think, was in the Jimny. And Jim Danik says, he's chipped in again and says, my daughter was keen on a Jimny for her first car. Thank goodness the 12-month waiting list put her off. So, <laughs> Jim, <laughs> Is that what put her Jim, off? <laughs> Jim, Jim's, not a, uh, Jim's not a fan of the Jimny, it would appear. And wow. is kind of happy that his daughter hasn't found her way behind the wheel of one. Um, David Burt chipped in again and said, I, I was in the Hyundai Active um, and uh, la, a venue active last week. And uh, he said, Hyundai Active has little 15 inch wheels, because I'd call them little 15 inch wheels. Yes. I must be old. I remember as a kid the exotic nature of the 15 inch wheels fitted to the brand new VB Commodore SLE. <laughs> <laughs> With Uniroyal 19560s, oh. I recently tried getting 13-inch rubber for my 30-year-old trailer. It wasn't as easy as I thought. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought of mini owners. How about 10-inch mm -hmm. for um, a classic mini? I don't know yeah. how many suppliers would still – you'd be right into the classic specialist tyres. I think, I think you have to actually now, go – I think you've got to go through Lego to get them now. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's right. So <laughs> biggest, someone, biggest tyre manufacturer exactly, in the world, by the way. Exactly, yeah. Well, yeah. James, as someone who owns a mini-based car, I have yeah. a Morris 1100 from 64. Okay. Yes. Um, when I had to get the 12-inch, uh, the 11-inch uh, mm -hmm. tyres for that. Sorry, 11 or 12. How did you go? What mm. was the process there? The answer's up there. Um, <laughs> I, I had to. So some, I, the, the, uh, the, the answer lay in kind of, I could have gone trailer tyres or some sort of kind of small commercial vehicle yeah. um, application, like, you know, that you can get, you know, dual control. A, not, a I forklift mean, or a skid steer or something like <laughs> yeah, that. Something yeah, something like that. No, no, yeah. you know how some, some, uh, some vans have, um, you know, when they've got four, Wheels, like yeah, four wheels. Wheel. They've got the dually yeah. axle, but yeah, with so, little yeah. tyres. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That was the option. In, in the end, there, there were a couple of um, uh, more obscure 
tire manufacturers that did offer that size. But wow. I'm, I'm not going to get Michelin's or you know that sort no. of thing. No, so, yeah, or or try one of the uh, the, the antique tire suppliers. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And um and mortgage your house. I have to do it for <laughs> my bill, but that's another. That's story, true. So, yeah. yeah. Now, in more general commentary, uh, we touched also, I think, uh, on the Cordia, uh, the Mitsubishi Cordia last oh, week. Um, it was awesome. mentioned in the same breath as the Starion and the Scorpion, and you know, sports cars from Mitsubishi um, of the eighties, and. Mm. Uh, Cordia would be a great name for an electric-only three-door liftback coupe, says Ashley. And oh. Jim Zanuck, who I think initially alerted us to the uh, Cordia, or it may have been um, Birdie, Ashley, do you mean extension Cordia, uh, which I think would be a fantastic <laughs> limited edition of, uh, of the car down the track, just to keep, keep interest going. Are you saying the, so seven, the seven-seater version, maybe? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. it was Birdie that alerted us to it. It was Andrew Burt says, Laura Brannigan went to school up the road from here in Armonk, New York. Cheers, Andrew Burt, Bertie's brother, who's an, ex, an X7 driver. So he's over in, uh, in New York and wow. Laura Brannigan uh, went to school just up the road. Uh, rest in peace, Laura. Oh, She's yeah. Great. So yeah. Hammer Rocks says, shut up and take my money. Ford, build the Bronco in right-hand drive and I'll take a four-door wild track. It's uber cool and based on its US pricing, cheaper than the new Defender and most likely more reliable and better built. So Ford's made a decision, no right-hand drive um, on Bronco, but there's one customer that's gone big. Yep, and I'm sure there's plenty more uh, that would yeah. love to see a Bronco. I'm one. I'd love to see the Bronco. Yeah, mm-hmm. but, yeah. Um, you it, know, this is just the way of the world. We're on the wrong side of the road. We drive on the wrong side of the car for the majority of the really cool stuff. It <laughs> might. It might. Look, I don't think the uh, – look, I don't mean to, um, to instill hope in humanity, but I don't think the conversation is yet over with him forward. Okay. I, think, I think that there was, uh, as Andrew uh, pointed out in his story, there have been successes in the past with Ford Australia convincing uh, uh, Ford US right. with, with the Mustang, the S550 Mustang. Um, so I think they just want to launch the car and then yeah. consider what's going on. And given that that yeah. Bronco was completely engineered in Australia using yes. T6 parts, yes, mm. it's not uh, – it, it ain't over. So Okay. Yeah. Well, that's never good. That's never. hopeful news. Yeah. So, I mean, keep the money uh, in the safe hammer. You never know. <laughs> it, it seems like there's – it seems like hope springs eternal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yep. Decoult came in and said he couldn't agree more with Tom, who was ruminating on the S660 from Honda and wishing how much it had come uh, to Australia. And Decoult says, when I saw it, I immediately Googled for conditions for Japanese car imports to Oz, but unfortunately, it's not so easy. I mean, mm. there, there are plenty of sites that will facil- uh, facilitate that kind of low volume import, but no, it's yeah. not an easy process by any stretch. There are a few on sale in Australia as well, but they're like thirty thousand to thirty five thousand dollars. Um and yeah, I mean there's other really good cars for that much money. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would be thinking twice, but uh, it really, becomes a different equation, doesn't it? Exactly. Yeah. You you're paying for exclusivity there. So yeah. 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 All right. Now to finish it off, Joel Bowden Funny you mentioned the Fiat Fremont because I had actually expressed amazement that anybody had bought a Fiat and Fremont, but I think, I think he's contacting us from the US. He says, I actually see more of the Fiat than the Dodge equivalent, uh, the Journey. Surprisingly, around my area, there are actually a lot of Fremonts. Saw four different ones in one day, which had me baffled, and it would certainly have me baffled as well. I've got yeah. to Yeah, they must have a good Fiat dealer there. Oh, Hold on, we've got a Fremont champion. No, no, no. Can I just add something? Uh, about a year ago, I, here where I live in, in Melbourne, I was cycling around Princess Park yeah. um, because, you know, it's, it's a safe place to cycle. And I saw a Fiat fullback. Oh, uh, Fiat fullback. So I, you, I, so I commandeered. Version. Correct. Oh, you, you know your stuff. Matt. Wow. I, so I commandeered the driver and he got out. And he was an Italian bloke. An Aussie Italian, like like me and you too, Matt. And, <laughs> to a degree. <laughs> uh, to a degree, yeah, that's right. Yeah, same, to a degree. <laughs> and he said, oh, you know, I, I just like the idea of having a Fiat. And so I bought this Triton and he imported from Britain the grill, the uh, the badge. Oh, I see. And the steering wheel. Wow. Uh, wow. And he drives around in a Fiat fullback. And <laughs> Whoa, whoa, there you go. That's how excited I got. My wallet just tipped over. So, 
so I haven't told anyone that story. And That's I extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like and, the like, commitment. So, yeah. folks out there, you can actually go online, uh, go to eBay, wherever, and buy fit full. If you own a Triton, that is, um, buy a <laughs> yeah. fullback um, kit and uh, turn your Mitsubishi into something else. Well, I, 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 I know a certain person known to all of us who has a friend that has created the one and only Toyota Bertrand, yes. uh, which is a, a ute version of the Lexan yes. and has custom badge work made. It is one of one yeah. and a very interesting car. Yeah. It is, uh, it is. Yeah. But I think, uh, can we just go back to fullback for a second? I think fullback is one of the greatest names for a ute ever. Just like the, double, full back. the double movement of like there's, oh. there's, there's the fullback as in, sure. but yeah. also the Italian link to soccer. It's amazing. Sure. No, or rugby league. You, you'd have your special well. edition Tommy Turbo as, <laughs> as uh, a fullback Tommy Turbo. The, the Mitsubishi Latrell Mitchell. Yeah. <laughs> so, so hell, it's sort of okay. So, I, I proposed to you, and this is copyrighted 2010. Us, <laughs> what about gridiron? Yes, yeah, the gridiron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, be a great particularly if it was a V8, that could just be the name for the engine. Yes, yeah. Mm. yeah. Oh, man. all right. Now, speaking of engines, market. speaking of uh, vehicles of a similar ilk, we're going to talk again about the baby Ranger, um, a mini or a compact dual cab ute. Um, that would sit underneath a kind of ranger-sized uh, vehicle. There's been all kinds of chat. We know a certain amount about it, uh, that it would be based on the Focus Escape uh, platform, the, the uh, power – it would be similar to Hyundai Santa Cruz in that it wouldn't be considered to be a hard-working ute. It's more of a, a lifestyle vehicle. Um, and it would be powered by EcoBoost engines, one5 and two litre. But Byron, you've got some news on whether or not we could potentially be seeing this car here? I have, I have. We should, I should draw this out so to keep you know people waiting. But, <laughs> um, and by the way, should I say, we could have easily have said from a um, Mitsubishi with, uh, with, with a different badge to uh, the Ford with a different badge, mm. because um, as you know, the car is rumoured to be called the Maverick, and yes. there was a Ford badge Nissan Patrol known as the Ford Maverick. No, but so it anyway, was. It's show what so yeah, was. It, it, yeah. yeah, that's right. So I think we've lost we've lost about half our audience now. From there. <laughs> but, but back to but back to the um, to the car that we are assuming is going to be called the Ford Maverick. Yeah. Uh, so that car is essentially for. Uh, the Central and South American markets and the backy South African markets where uh, where a Subaru Brumby slash um, Proton Jumbuck style vehicle sells as the market. Yes. Where Australia, Australia is becoming more and more like North America in that we want our medium-sized trucks to actually grow into full-size trucks. I mean, that is just the trend. And... Uh, I understand that uh, the car has been rejected for Australia because there simply isn't the market. But um, I, I wonder if in the vortex that, that is left behind by that big rush towards bigger trucks, there isn't an opportunity for something small like that. And I think by the same token, Ford Australia has said, and they, they to your point earlier, Byron, they, they quoted the Mustang experience as um, – uh, a situation where they were able to petition Ford in, in Dearborn and say, look, this is our specific market case and end up successful. So whether it's Bronco, whether it's this thing, I mean, there, there would be a possibility, I suppose. There is, but it, so you're given a choice with limited resources. What would you prefer if you're a Ford Australia um, product planner? Do you yep. want to get a focus-based passenger car style you? Yeah. Or... Do you want to put the resources behind a Bronco? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, we know the resources behind an F-150. Yeah. Or, yeah. well, so that's another story because mm -hmm. the F-150 and the Ranger will eventually become very closely related towards the end of this decade. Mm -hmm. But that's probably a story for the next podcast or future <laughs> podcast. But coming back, to, uh, the, coming back to the Ford Maverick slash Focus um, utility, yep. this yep. vehicle – is essentially a Bronco 
the Bronco Sport, mm. right? You know, the small of the Bronco, it's essentially a Bronco Sport, Sport. pickup. Yep. 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 So I feel that given the regular Bronco, like the 4x4 one, is based on the T6 platform, and that is an Australian engineered thing, mm. we are much more likely to see the Bronco, Bronco. Than, than the Focus, right. uh, based right. Ford Maverick. Anecdotally, yes. anecdotally, I've spent the last four months in Cowra in the central west of New South Wales, and one of well, there's a few. You don't really, look it, mate. Thank you. Um, there's a few <laughs> really popular um, vehicles out there that I noticed. Um, they are cab chassis Ford um, Falcon Utes, and also pickups uh, the Utes, the Commodore Utes. You know, the ones that we right. we miss so much, obviously, um, and. I was speaking to my father-in-law who was selling, telling me that he's thinking about getting something different to his uh, Falcon RTV, which is the rugged terrain vehicle with the yeah, rocking yeah. red diff. Um, yeah. And it is like, he goes, oh, I want something that drives like a car but is a ute. And he's not alone. There are, no, there no. are potentially thousands of people out there who want something that drives like a car but is a ute. Yes. Um, that don't want to spend fifty grand on a Ranger, uh, yes. and I think there is there is an untapped uh, part of the market here. I, I do think that at some point there will be a manufacturer that that plays there. Um, like you say, Byron, I'm I'm on the same page as you. I think Ford Australia is much more likely uh, to invest their time, effort, money, and everything else in getting a Bronco here because mm -hmm. if you could have a Bronco line alongside the Mustang and the Ranger. You don't need any other cars. No, um, true. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. It's, it's, that's the business. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, it is sad to see that, you know, there's potentially no potential for a Maverick or, or Courier or whatever it may be called um, sold here. Uh, but, yeah. you know, that's just, that's just it. That's just yeah, the yeah. priorities. And as Ford sales have, you know, in the ute market have gone up and in the passenger car and SUV passenger SUV style ones have sort of dipped away. Um, I think that, you know, there's, there's certainly going to be uh, some things that we need to see more of in the Ford lineup and they include boxy SUVs. <laughs> I agree. The, the, I agree. The only, the only other, one other thing I might tip in there is that Chesto did some digging and uh, the consensus from what he was able to discover was that pricing in the U S for this Maverick would start as low as 20,000 mm. um, US dollars. So it could be uh, an interesting prospect on that basis alone. If it was able to be brought to market at a relatively affordable price, that may yeah. change things. Yeah. So we're, this car will be built, as uh, Andrew wrote, and as you have discussed in the past, in Mexico. So um, that kind of does put um, a, pri a pricing pressure, given the currency situation, even though we do have the free, grade, free trade agreement with, um, with the North American markets. But the other thing is that, and to, to your point too, Matthew, if you've got a choice, like your father-in-law has got a choice between a Ford Maverick and a Hyundai Santa Cruz, mm. what do you reckon he'd go for? It's a good question. I, I, because, um, from what we've seen. From, oh, well, from what we've seen, um, I don't know. I don't know. Like, the, I would think that I'd be able to talk him into the Hyundai because I think the Hyundai might be a a, a better option. Um, it, yeah, it looks like an El Camino in a way. Yeah, like, yeah. on stilts. Like, it yeah. has that coupe kind of swoopy. I can't wait to see the production yeah. version of that car, um, yeah. or that Ute, yeah. I should say, or that is it a Ute? Is it a car? <laughs> no. <laughs> what do we call these things? Oh, well, yeah. Well, the car, it is definitely, as you know, a monocoque. It's based yeah. on a um, car. However. I heard on the on the uh, download that it's not going to be here, if at all, before twenty twenty two or twenty three. Right, wow. right, right, right. And and that's about is. that's about satisfying primary demand before thinking about other markets. I presume. Correct. Yes. And we all know yeah. that Hyundai needs a, a Hilux, a proper Ute, um, yeah. more than they need a a, a passenger focused. Um, that's a one. great point too. Like that a Subaru a Brat. Point. Remember yeah. When I was a well, kid, when I was a kid, I don't know, James, you, you, because you, you and I have similar vintage. Uh, did you, did you hanker over a Subaru Brat, the Brumby Brat? 
No, I think I was more impressed by um, a person I went to school with. I've got memories of Datsun 180B triple S coupes. Um, <laughs> his brother and one of his brother's friends had identical uh, Kalahari tan um, 180B triple S coupes. So yeah. that, that's one of my stronger memories from that period in time. Well, you know, well, you say that period, but that was seven years earlier, but that's okay because I'm talking about <laughs> 1979, I think. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, or 78, really. But yeah, mm-hmm. everyone mm-hmm. loves the 180B triple S. Now, what, what this does lead us to, though, is we've been talking about Bronco and we've been talking about Utes and Ford, which heads us towards Ranger for 2022. And Byron, you authored a story this week for us, which was about things we've learned recently about how the Bronco may have influenced and vice versa. They're, they're, you know, underpinned by many of the same things. Fill us in on what you've discovered. Well, thank you for that, James. Yes, I I have uh, dug around and done some research and spoken to a few people who, uh, you know, where we're all wearing face masks down here when we're outside of our homes, so yeah, I, yeah. I can't even name. So you, you've I mumbled, you mumbled, mumbled to a few, to <laughs> a few people. people. Yeah. Yep. So um, it's not that widely uh, talked about within Ford, but of course, as we all know, the uh, the Bronco was engineered here in Broadmeadows or yep. nearby here, and so the Australian engineering team, with a lots lots of help, obviously from the rest of the Ford engineering world, um, <clears throat> created the Bronco off the T6 platform. Okay. But what happened was, once uh, because the T6 was uh, engineering on the T6, the original Ranger started in two thousand and seven. Yeah. So the updates and the progress that they made with the Bronco is now filtering back to the mother car. Gotcha. So. So in this story, uh, it, we've been calling it the T6.2 yep, as opposed to the T7 because it is an evolution of the uh, existing platform, as, as we know. All right. And so uh, things like, for instance, the, uh, the front suspension of the, uh, of the front axle has been moved forward in order to accommodate the larger engines that are coming for the Ranger and the Everest, I should add, as well. Okay. Uh, as as well as a whole bunch of other things, uh, improvements, including um, more driver assist systems, um, upgraded multimedia as part of the Sync 4. Um, right. Um, yeah. Entertainment system, which will be a great thing. An all-new dash, yep. which if you look at the F-Series, uh, the new F-Series, F-150 might give you an idea of what the dash will look like. Yep. Um, and um, a few other things. But, the, yeah, the powertrains really are the uh, the big news. And, by the way, Everything I say also applies to the Volkswagen Amarok too, because that of car course. is of course basically it it's basically going to be a badge engineered Ranger with a slightly different nose. Yes, because the the T six <clears throat> has had its tenth birthday, um, hasn't mm. it? Really, it's it's very long in the tooth. It's successful, mm. continues mm. to be popular, but it is um, ready, ripe for a replacement. Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day. How Mazda has actually beaten Ford to replacement um, sure. of its of its unit with the new uh, BT50 coming out based on the the D Max and yep. and we're we're how how many years away before we see the 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 new generation Ranger in Australia one one and a half yeah so we're going to we have to see it. it's going to be introduced in the last quarter of next year okay or it, it'll probably be unveiled probably in the middle of the year. Like that's yeah. before we'll start. It's it's teasing it or showing us first photos. But um, it's probably going to be on sale by right by Christmas, if not early in twenty twenty two. Yeah, right. And do but, we have any word on the Amarok? Is that the same sort of timeline, or because it's it's old as the hills as well? So I I think that there might be a little bit of uh, rivalry between the Ford and the Volkswagen cabs as to who's going to come out with the cars first. Because, what yeah. a surprise. What a yeah, surprise. I know, I know. So uh, th- th- they're bedfellows, as we know, because they're doing the EV thing and Ford's building the next generation transporter, which is the uh, the great, great um, successor to the car I'm sitting in right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, the transit will become um, – we'll, but then, of course, we're getting the Caddy version um, for, with a Ford badge as you for the uh, upcoming, I forgot what the name is. It'll, what's the name of the Ford? Little Ford Transit Connect. Connect. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Nice one. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so there's, so, there's this, um, a love loss there, I'm sure, yeah, between those two companies. Well, they're yeah. they're, they're in com- in cahoots, but in competition as well. And uh, you know that that's always good for what it gives the consumer because it means that you're going to get more advanced, um, but also 
co-developed cars. So if there are problems in one batch, you can assume that there's going to be problems in another batch and mm. uh, it should mean that they're quicker to fix things. Mm. You'd yeah. think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but um, Sorry, James, I was just going to say, but further to your point, you were saying earlier, James, uh, about uh, six-cylinder or petrol-powered pickup trucks. Yep. The, uh, the V6 EcoBoost 2.7-litre turbo EcoBoost is slated for... Yeah, the, uh, the 2022 Ranger. So yeah, yeah. There's your answer there. Folks. Interesting. Yeah. And you were also uh, your mail was that there'd be a turbo diesel um, V6 as well. Yeah, that um, comes from. Yeah, I'm using yeah. your words, not mine here. But the Power Stroke out of the F150, a version thereof. Is that? Right? Oh, we love a Power Stroke. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a picture of a lawnmower with a with a power stroke uh, in the backyard. So, okay. the um, the that V six that three liter V six uh, is doing uh, sterling service in the F series and has been, I think, for a yeah. number of years. Yeah, and yeah, it's a natural. And of course, that points to the next generation vehicle in the latter half of this decade. Okay, where F one series, F series, and Ranger will converge. And right. we know that um, Amarok V6 has been the standout for that yes. for that model. Uh, they sell a huge proportion of all Amaroks in Australia are V6s because that's just such a popular thing. It's in demand and, yep. you know, people want a V6 dual cab ute. So good on well, it. It offers a pretty good balance between, you know, performance and efficiency. Mm. Um, mm. It's been around a while, but it still stands up well oh. on that score. It's a beautiful oh, engine. One. Yeah, oh, 100%. Yeah, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm not a U person. I'd have a Amarok V6. Yeah. Yeah, the, right. the, the tragedy of that is Australia is the only country in the world, basically, where the Amarok is fired. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah exactly. Good point. Mm. All right, well, I think we'll leave it there. It'd be great to get people's thoughts on that conversation and, and see where they stand on the small mm. ute, large ute, where they are. Are they in the purchase cycle? We'd love to hear yeah. what you're thinking. But we'll move to cars that we have been driving uh, in the last week. And, Matt, I'd like to kick it off with you. It's one that you've had for a little while and you'll be having for a little while further. Yep, it's a Hyundai Kona Highlander two-wheel drive. Um, this is my new long-term loan car, uh, replacing a Honda HRV RS that I had previously. So I'm sticking in the small SUV camp, um, yep. but this one's actually a small SUV. So um, it's got a tiny interior. Uh, the back seat is a little bit compromised and the boot is compact, is the yep. best word for it. Yes. Um, so already we've had some, um, some shortcomings in terms of uh, usability. Um, but I have to say that it's a it's a really intriguing little vehicle. I mean, Highlander spec, you get things like a sunroof, you get heated seats, cooled seats, electric adjustment for the seats, and a heated steering wheel. Um, and in winter, that's yeah. just so good. Uh, I know. It, it, it seems a bit awesome. over the top until it's a cold day and you get in the car. And oh, oh, you go, oh, that's so yeah. good. That's yeah, yeah, so true. nice. True. Um, and, yeah, it's been um, – I've had it for about a month now. Uh, Long-term update number one will be up shortly. Um, and uh, we're also going to feature this car in a comparison very soon, which you'll be uh, seeing on the Cars Guide site and our YouTube channel if you're watching there. Um, cool. And it's uh, going up against a Duke, the new Nissan Duke TI, which is only available as a two-wheel drive. Um, so the, the good thing about the Kona is you can get it as a, a two-litre petrol with the standard six-speed auto and yep. uh, front-wheel drive. Yep. Or if you really want it, you can get a more powerful 1.6-litre turbo petrol with the dual-clutch auto. And I, um, I've... And, oh, sorry, and IRS as well. Exactly. Yep, yep. So otherwise you get a torsion beam rear suspension, right. uh, whereas in the other one you get IRS. So um, yeah. it's all-wheel drive. You get the advantage of all-wheel drive. You get the turbo thrust. Um, but there's no, uh, there's none of them available for me to compare <laughs> like for like on the Hyundai press fleet. So I'm a little I bit see. annoyed, but um, because I'm, I, I do have some things to say about the two liter engine, but you'll have to read my review uh, uh, now, update. Um, you know, at a purely superficial level, don't judge me. I, um, I think the Kona is a terrific looking little car. I really, yeah. really like the design. I think it's a big success um, yeah. and it has drawn a lot of attention. 100%. And I think they've done really well with their colours um, yeah. because we know that oh. people 
one of the most searched terms around Hyundai Kona in Australia is colours. Okay. And they have okay. done a really, really good job of meeting the needs of or expectations of people who want something that's more exciting than the burgundy, black, white, and yeah. grey you get on like, <laughs> yeah, that's bravo, right. bravo yeah, Hyundai. That's right. And other yeah. other car makers just listen up, eh? Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah exactly. All and right. I, yeah. I, uh, I was just going to say, um, I will say that it looks better as a high-spec car with the bigger wheels than it does as a low-spec car with the little wheels. Super. So. All right. Well, that's good. We'll look forward to those updates as, as time goes by. Thanks. Now, speaking of time going by, the car that you're going to highlight, Byron, um, has seen some kilometres under its wheels, but it's very timely in terms of its nameplate. Would you <laughs> like to share? You, you, you are the owner, just for the benefit of our audience, uh, of yes, a that's fleet, right. you know, Honest Byron's... Um, <laughs> you have a, a stock of top quality used that's vehicles right. so, uh, distributed used at various car? points around your suburb. <laughs> look no further than on Aspirins, a um, uh, used car lot. Um, but you, you, are, you famously have, uh, you rotate the stock occasionally, keep it fresh, but yes. you, you do have a number of vehicles um, that, that you own, yeah? That, that's right. So um, the, the only way I can maintain uh, friendships is to bribe uh, my hapless friends with, um, hey, take my free car, um, garage it, <laughs> and uh, for maybe a year or two. Uh, right. Because I have 10 cars and I live in the inner city. So yep. <laughs> I, I, I can only fit five cars in and around my property. So All right. it's, it's a way of keeping cars fresh. But what I wanted to talk to you about the fantastic Focus ST, but um, really, uh, which is um, this orange colored. Uh, hot hatch thing that I love, but we've spoken about this before, you guys have. So I'm turning to my other orange car and there might be a picture of it coming up about <laughs> there now. There will be. There somewhere. will be. There and will that be. is, of course, my 1973 Toyota Corona RT81 <laughs> SE. Wow. The 12 R engine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so how long have you had that one, Byron? So when I started primary school in the 1970s, <laughs> um, one of my teacher crushes... <laughs> I think her name was Miss Hallard, used to drive a Corona. She had a, an orange Corona SE. And, you know, I was, I was uh, an impressionable boy, but I was really into my cars back then. And since then, I've always hankered for a Corona SE. Wow. Yeah, I've moved on from the Miss so Hallards of this world, you, though. You, but you, I, you, I was going to say, you, you sort her out. You yeah. reconnected, bought her car, and that's, <laughs> that's the right. one that's next to the trend. I stalked it. No, I did not. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. I didn't stalk anyone. Yeah. Um, so not seriously, find, anyway. Yeah, not, yeah, well, yeah, just, yeah. So, I, right. uh, so I've been searching for the last few years for a, uh, a, a second-generation Corona in Australia. They were, they were actually internationally the fourth-generation Corona. All right. The yeah. TR or something. And I finally found this car last November. Uh, it was on, uh, on Gumtree. Yep, and I swooped down, like swooped down to buy this car. It was just the spec I wanted. I love the color. Uh, I love the fact that it's got the three-speed Toyota Glide automatic, which is the Azen Thirty transmission, because it is the second slowest car I've ever owned <laughs> after this Transporter, this um, which had fifty-one kilowatts of power back in nineteen eighty-two. Wow. That thing is just like wow. Yeah. But it's smooth. It's everything works on it. Uh, and it is utterly original inside and out. So, oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Do you know, Byron, I once drove a transporter of the same generation as that one from mm -hmm. Sydney uh, south to do some skiing down at um, Mount Kosciuszko. And I know for a fact the aero hits a wall at 100 kilometres an hour. And there is no <laughs> way known to mankind that that vehicle will go any quicker than that, be it the engine power or the aero lack of efficiency. Oh, James, you are spot on. So I bought this car in Canberra in, uh, yeah. a couple of years ago and drove it down with my best mate uh, down okay. to Melbourne. And yeah. my uh, my GPS app, which told me the actual speed, actual I, could speed. Not, yep. I could not break the speed limit in this car on, on the, on the <laughs> hue. Right. That's right. Could not. So you're car, spot on. Yeah. It's safest safe car on you, the planet. Your license <laughs> yeah. is safe. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now, these cars were the safest vans you could um, buy back in the day. So, mm. yeah. But, yeah, they're not fast. Yeah. Now, look, I'll, I'll, um, I'll chip in and finish up with a car that I've been driving this week, Audi RS3, um, mm. the sportback version of that car. It's just a bit over 80 grand before you put it on the road, um, Australian dollars. 
two and a half litre turbo five cylinder. So that engine has been around a little while, but that's not to say anything against it. No. Um, and a Love seven it. speed uh, dual clutch. It's all wheel drive, the Audi Quattro system. Uh, 294 kilowatts out of mm. two and a half litres, 480 newton metres. And that's from 1950 up to 5850 RPM. All of that torque is available. It only weighs 1,555 kilos, so it's a little car, but it's also quite light. So unlike some other Audis that, that are a bit portly, um, this one's reasonably weighted for its size. In the plus column, I've got cracking engine. It just goes really hard. Um, in terms of numbers, it's 0 to 100, a bit above four seconds. So that, that's really rapid. And it sounds like Walter Rawls sport quattro from you know the the 1980s it yeah. sounds so great um it looks great the seats are fantastic it's it's standing up pretty well the steering wheel it's i think it's an alcantara or suede and leather combo it's very good ergonomically but then on the on the flip side it's pretty tight in terms of packaging um for its size i think it's showing its age a little bit there and um, it's particularly squeezy in the back um, there are yeah. some more uh, modern competitors that are a bit better in that regard. Um, and despite the digital instruments, which is that virtual cockpit, which is terrific, it's looking a little dated inside. Mm -hmm. um, not that it's, that's won't put some people off, but just by comparison to your Mercs of this world with their glassy screens and all of that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. it's, it's looking a little bit off the pace. Yeah. Um, and a new gen model, I think, is due in a year or so's time. Mm -hmm. So it is... It is in the twilight of, of this generation. And the dual clutch, dual clutch I found a bit loose at times, particularly at low parking speeds. You get some of that rollback, which more modern dual clutches, aren't. you're not really getting that um, yeah. anymore. So that was a bit of a surprise. But overall, I really enjoyed uh, the week in that car. Around the city, it was just huge fun. Huge All right, JC, question. I, I mm. drove the sedan version a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, you can find the review on Cars Guide. I uh -huh. loved it as well. Uh -huh. um, and I just want to know, would you go sedan or would you go the sport back? I'd go sport back um, yeah. only because from a practicality point of view, I quite like wagons. Mm. Um, I'm a bit of a wagon person. Just the ability to open up that back door without any limitations of the aperture of a boot and just put stuff in for mine is the most practical. James, um, James, James, James. Well, then the answer is, is right there. You could, for, for the price of an RS3 sport mm. back, you can buy 14 Volvo 850 turbos with a five-pot turbo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. There you go. There that you would go. have been an impressive fleet, yeah. Oh. I mean, that would, that's a rental company right there. It's not, <laughs> right not, there. not the you right just... time to launch one, but still, an interesting oh, thought. I would rent an 850 turbo wagon off you any day. <laughs> it's not exactly a catchy business name, rent a Volvo 850 turbo wagon.com.au. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> oh, oh, no, I would, I would have it as... How sweet it is. Hey, that's much better. That is much better. Yeah. Now, um, speaking of how sweet it is, it's time for us to go to Musk Watch. Musk Watch. Watch. Right. So, the impression I got this week was that the deer leader is bored. He's not, he's not got a lot on. You know, the, the space mission has been successful. Um, the, the Tesla's worth a squillion dollars, and he's just kind of twiddling his thumb. So he's been on Twitter quite a lot. And he posted up, you don't have a soul, you are a soul. Now, that's setting itself up for, for, for some kind of comeback. Mm. But that statement is often attributed to C.S. Lewis. Um, there's conjecture as to whether or not that's correct. But as usual, there was no recognition from the dear leader as to where this came from. Mm -hmm. Ostensibly, this was his own inspirational thought. Um, what, what Lewis is said to have said was, you don't have a soul, you are a soul, you have a body. So your essential being is just transported around in this thing. So a philosophical kind of statement. But Scarborough came back and said, like you'd know, which I thought was <laughs> a pretty, pretty good put down. And Savage Brenda said, Amber Heard, <laughs> definitely, she has no soul. Oh. And I know that Elon's been implicated in uh, the Amber Heard uh, Johnny Depp debacle. Mm -hmm. um, Raphael Khan Bishal echoed a thought um, that various others put up there. He said he's high again, and uh, <laughs> he may may have well revisited the the <laughs> Joe Rogan podcast prior to making this comment. Um, but then Jordan Levine said, "I am a Kia soul," which I thought was uh, was the best. Oh. Of all. Oh. Good comeback, but. <laughs> Also, he then invited people to say, he said, where are the memes? 
send in the memes. You know, where are the clowns? Send in the clowns. So this is just an invitation. This is why I think he was bored. Yeah. But um, Dan E actually came up with one which I thought was terrific. It's actually a Tom Toro cartoon who draws for The New Yorker. And the, there are two characters, two men, and one saying to the other, they say those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. Yet those who do study history are doomed to stand by helplessly while everyone else repeats it. And <laughs> that was a pretty, pretty good cartoon. Yeah. Dominic said, I want my model Y now. <laughs> and lame person said, Elon, you're officially my dad and I demand a not a flamethrower and a Tesla, a rocket ship and some alkali metals and I also want to go to space. So I thought that was a, a pretty fair, fair request from a lame person. <laughs> He's been um, trolled by the trolls. This is the, is, world, troll. this is the world that Elon Musk actually inhabits. <laughs> you know, he may have this public persona of being a uh, very successful business person. This is where he lives. Yeah. Um, he's, but, he's married to Grimes. Surely she's got something to say about it. Probably. Probably. I haven't, I haven't gone there very often because mm. much as I, I quite like Grimes' music, I don't know what's rattling around between her ear, ears. I'm not, uh, <laughs> not particularly thrilled by that. Mm. Um, but then finally he said, not finally, but most recently he said, nothing has gaslit more people than the movie Gaslight. And of course that, that is where, you know, the, the whole term comes from. Ingrid Bergman. Joseph Cotton and a very young oh. Angela Lansbury, Lansbury in, that's in right. Gaslight as well. Her first role, apparently. Absolutely. Yep. So the, you've got various people came back and said, no, no, the biggest gaslighters were Elon himself, Trump, um, Amber Heard. But then Mark Hartnett said, other than gaslights, which, is, <laughs> which I thought was a really good um, lateral response. Yeah. But the share price. Now, this has been a story all of its own in recent months, yeah. of course. So the Tesla share price at current check is $1,513.07. So when we checked in last week, it was fifteen forty six. So a slight drop back. That, that vertical ascendancy seems to have uh, stopped just for the moment. But during the week, there was a high of $1,677. Wow. Um, that was yesterday. So it is still up in that stratospheric space. Is that Aussie um, dollars? Uh, that would be U.S. dollars. Oh, I guess. I guess that's U.S. dollars. Yeah, right. So Market Watch, in an opinion piece, Elon Musk doesn't want – he said Elon Musk does, he doesn't want Tesla to be super profitable. That's in an earnings call to um, announce Q2 um, profit, which was very tiny. Mm. Um, Tesla Inc. chief executive Elon Musk, who heads a company with a valuation approaching $300 billion, doesn't want the electric vehicle maker to be, quote, super profitable. Um, he, he got his way in the second quarter because um, they squeezed out a profit of $104 million, and that's on the back of more than $400 million in electric vehicle tax credits, which is a big part, let's not forget, of the Tesla business model. Um, some investors are banking on Tesla becoming the apple of this world, and it's largely on this whole autonomy self-driving thing, mm. um, which to the uninitiated, it seems like that's where things are going. But to people who have investigated it, even to a mid middle depth, it's not coming anytime soon, no matter what Elon says, um, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Um, so we'll, well, we'll, we'll see. His claims around Tesla having um, full autonomy by the end of 2020 is, is, it could be factually true. The way that he's worded it is that Tesla may have it, but right. not that Tesla's. Not no. the Model S's and Model 3's not, on the road. Not, will. not consumers, not consumers. Yeah. He, he, he was asked how far down that track um, have you gone? And he talked about, oh, well, we've put some new games in the car and, you know, we've made it more fun. So that, that really substantiates the claim, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, it's, he says he's been using full self-driving, he alleges. He says it's like amazing. Um, <laughs> so it's almost getting, almost getting to the point where I can go from my house to work with no interventions, despite going through construction and widely varying situations. So wow. this is why I am very confident about full self-driving and functionality by the end of this year, because I'm literally driving it. Well, is he literally not driving it? Isn't well, he's point? literally <laughs> not driving it because he said he's almost getting to the point. So <laughs> I, I think he's absolutely shot himself in the foot. Oh, who's, who's driving it, his body or his soul? Yeah. Oh, good point. Very good point. I could go further, but I won't because that would be rude. He but I think, 
<laughs> I, I, there you go. I, I think with that, we have reached the finish line. And I want to say thank you, Byron. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And, and thank you, Matt. Thank you. And thanks to our communications ambassador, undefeated hide and seek champion, and swan aficionado, Mr. Pritchard, for making us look and sound like we kind of know what we're doing. Uh, today, he's in a t shirt saying, My sex life is like a Ferrari. I don't have a Ferrari. Um, he's also wearing Angry Bird fat pants and mop shoes. Unbelievable ensemble. Um, Please pass on the word about the podcast and let us know your thoughts by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Please do that. If you're an Apple podcast listener, please rate and review us. And remember, you can watch us on YouTube. But before we go, mate of mine spent $300 on a limo this week only to discover the fee didn't include a driver. Can you believe it? He spent all that money on a ride and has nothing to show for it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. <laughs> oh, thank you indeed.